what about the other stuff? Like, wait, no, in the third one. Okay, hello everybody. Hello guys, take seats. Welcome again to another um, session of the EBD seminar. Today uh, we have kind of different sort of presentation, probably less academic, less scientific, but still very important for us as researchers. Uh, we have the pleasure to, I have the pleasure to present Paula Martin that has been already here in the EBD working for the last two years as academy, uh, as uh, te uh, technical assistants in the group of Ivan. And since she's gonna present a little bit of herself, I let her uh, introduce herself, okay? So Paula, the floor is yours. Thank you. So hi everyone, and welcome to how to make your data pop. Um, this is graphic design for scientists. So first of all, for people that don't know much about me, I've been around EBD for quite some time. But before that, I worked with movement ecology and habitat use of wildcats. I did my master thesis in movement ecology and habitat use of griffin vultures here at EBD in relationships to land uses and rewilding. And I'm currently a member of the Eco Evo Devo group. You might know us for those weirdos that really seem to like buckets and tadpoles, 
but they're excellent people. Um, others might recognize my alter ego, Paolo Martin Art, for my illustrations and PhD covers. But what you might actually not know is that I studied graphic design. This is actually why we're here today. I decided to combine these two passions of mine and realized that there's common ground between, between them. There are rules and tools in graphic design that can be easily applied to our content and science and help us actually make our data pop. And let's be honest, as scientists, uh, visual content, content is on a day-to-day -day basis. We're expected to create a lot of different types of visual content without really having the tools of how to do so. Um, but at the end of the day, what's important is that, that we communicate our findings. So this makes graphic design a fundamental tool in our work. Unfortunately, this is something that has been brushed aside as less important or neglected. But today we're going to um, apply some tools from graphic design to our content and you will see how far you can get. Um, we're going to see uh, some uh, different types of visual content with some of the examples of commissioned work I've done over the past few years. Um, but at the end it doesn't matter what type of visual content you create. Um, it doesn't matter if it's um, a cover design uh, for a PhD thesis or for a book or a guide or if it's a poster for a conference, uh, uh, a workshop or a course, or if it's figures like PCAs or violin plots or um, even maps, or if you do a presentation for a seminar or a congress. Um, you might even have to do some scientific illustration because you discovered a new species and there's poorly photographic evidence or you like wildlife photography, or you want to take a picture of your focal species, or some traits or habitat that is character characteristic of them. Or if you even want to share your content in social media or improve your outreach. At the end of the day, what's important is that we uh, increasingly need to communicate in a way um, that it's more accessible, quicker to interpret, easier to digest, and um, harder to misunderstand. In order for you to understand um, what graphic design could do for you as a scientist, uh, we need to um, talk a little bit about the basics, um, the fundamentals of graphic design. I've divided them into visual language, composition, color, and, ty and typography. So the first thing we need to get familiar with is visual language, or in other words, perception. Perception uh, refers to how our brain tries to interpret uh, different elements, um, similarities, structures, or information, and how it interprets uh, visual elements. So in this matter, it doesn't really matter if the signal is um, complete, because uh, the same message could be um, seen by our brain. Um, to better understand how our brain and visual perception works, we need to get familiar with uh, the principles of the psychology house Gestalt. Um, one of the most important ones is the foreground-background rule. Um, this takes advantages, advantage of how our brain processes negative space. Our brain will distinguish between the figure that it considers to be in the front, like the focal point, and the background, the area in which it rests. So when it gets interesting, it's when both foreground and background are distinct images, like we see there on the right. Another principle is the one of proximity. Here, our brain ties together elements that are close to each other. So, for example, on the right, we can see that by just adding a little bit of space in between the circles, our brain immediately identifies two separate columns rather than a group of circles. Another rule is the one of similarity. Here, elements are tied together by color, size or shape. Um, but they don't really have to be close to each other. It could be used in design to tie, tie together elements that don't have to be close to each other um, in a whole. Another way of seeing similarity is the focal point. If you have a lot of uh, similar elements and there's one that stands out for being different, our focus will go to that different shape. It could be uh, a different color, a different shape or a different size. 
but it makes um, the information st uh, stand out. Um, another principle we need to get familiar with in order to understand the following uh, principles is the one of past experience. Um, here our brain ties together visual elements with experiences we had in the past and that way uh, we can all see a traffic light here even though it's not complete or in the same way that we can recognize the save button on our computer or the icons on an app. Another uh, tightly related um, principle is the one of closure. Here our brain will try to fill in the missing gaps to try to um, complete an image to a whole. So here our brain would rather see overlapping triangles in three circles rather than three really tiny triangles in three Pac-Man-like figures. This only works if we have the same experiences, but I'm assuming we all went to primary school and know about triangles and circles. And we also might, all of us might have seen a light bulb or a dimension. Another principle is the one of symmetry. And this explains how our brain is extremely hardwired to search for symmetry. Um, it gives harmony and balance and it's widely spread in nature. This is why we're always uh, looking for symmetry everywhere. The last principle I'm going to explain today is the one of uh, simplicity or pregnance. And uh, it's a principle that says that our brain will always try to simplify images as much as it can. So for example here, our brain sees a triangle, a circle, and a rectangle, rather than a complex image composable of three of them. Um, the same happens, for example, to the Olympic game logo. Our brain sees overlapping circles rather than a complex image uh, completed by curved lines. We're, um, actually, we don't see anything else that overlapping circles. Over here, um, this is an example of how one image can have them all. We see that the, the rule of proximity applies because all of the shoes are next to each other. We see the similarity rule because it's the same shoe. And we see the closure principle because the tips of the shoe create a circle. And we have the foreground background rule because we have the floor as a uh, background and the shoes as the foreground but we have a third dimension into that um, law because uh, we see the circle. We also have symmetry. We have the focal point, again, the circle that we um, can see, and the past experience because we all can relate to the type of shoe. We all have seen a Converse All-Star. So this was all for the laws of Gestalt. There are many more, but for today's sake, I think we're okay. And I know this seems kind of abstract, but you're going to see how easy it is to apply to our content. So next in line is composition. Composition is extremely important to emphasize the most important elements in a design. And done correctly, it can make your design um, easier to read, um, more visually appealing, and also quicker to understand. And let's be honest, by the thriving of social media, or viewer's attention span has been shortened. Now it only takes a few seconds to a viewer to um, decide if he's going to look at your work any further or not. So this is especially important to be as clear as possible and that our visual content is uh, quick to understand. So put simple, composition is the way uh, or the art of arranging elements or single elements in a way that they work together as a whole. And um, for that, we need a structure, a grid, for example. There are several um, elements important in a grid, like a column, the rows, the gutter, the space in between them, or the margins. But you can um, design them however you want. At the end, what's important is that a, a grid helps you to create structure and helps to arrange the elements in a design. With the margins, uh, um, sorry, with the grid, we can create margins, we can align text, and we, uh, by keeping the same distance between the elements, we can also create symmetry and balance. Another very important thing is to create negative space. This is um, consciously leaving white spaces in your design so that it breathes and it's easier to read and avoids um, clutter and chaos. Another way um, of applying 
um, composition right, uh, correctly is using visual hierarchy. This means arranging elements from the most important to the least important, or at least deciding what you want your audience to focus first. So we can create visual hierarchy by creating contrast in different ways. For example, changing color, changing font, changing the size, making it bold, using capital letters, or even just by the placement on the page. But done properly, um, the most important elements in your design will grab your viewers' attentions immediately. And just by boosting or reducing the contrast in between the elements, you can highlight them or hide them. So you can take a step back and just think, what do I want the viewer to see first? And then just simply um, boosting the contrast between that element and the rest of the design. So we've seen the grid, text alignment, negative space, visual hierarchy, balance and symmetry. And also important is the repetition of a style because it gives, it gives a sense of um, uh, unity. And by repeating a certain elements like color or shapes or patterns, we can create a strong uh, visual language that ties together the whole design. For example, in a poster, if you use the same heather for every type of section or you use the same color paddle, palette, you will create a sense of unity rather than a collage of different parts that really don't belong together. So let's talk really briefly about color. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about basic color theory. I'm assuming you know about primary and secondary colors. Um, but let's refresh some terms. Um, there are complementary colors, the ones that are opposite to each other in the color wheel. We have analogous ones, the ones that are close to each other. And important also are monochromatic colors, one single color in different combinations of white and black. But there's really no right or wrong with color. The only thing that we have to follow is that we have to use color with intentions. There are several ways of doing that. One of them is understanding that colors also convey emotions. We've all heard that there are some colors tied or linked to, cer to, to certain emotions. Like for example, red to love or strength, yellow to happiness, green to nature, white to simplicity, um, black to, dramatically, uh, to dramatic or sophistication. Um, and at the end, it might not seem very important, but uh, unconsciously it is. It's, um, it takes part of our per perception and our past experiences, which is another way of using color. For example, if we see red, yellow, and sometimes orange, they remind us of signs like stop, danger, or attention. In general, uh, they're negative connotations, but at least they want to show us information to which we should pay attention to. So we can easily use that in our data. For example, let's say that you're plotting uh, the population's dynamic of a species that, is, that has a high risk of going extinct. So if you use that color, you're signalizing that this is important and you should pay attention to it. Um, the same way, you can also use green. Green is always associated with positive or good things. So depending on the message you want to send, um, you can play with these kinds of uh, past experiences. Another way of using color with intention is by using natural palettes, for example, that appear in your study system. So we could have, for example, a beach, a forest, or a prairie. You, we might not be familiar with your study system, but at least you're uh, using the, your color with intention. Another thing, to have or to consider with uh, when um, working with color is the contrast. It, this is especially important if you're working with text or small text and in presentations, the contrast between the foreground and the background should be high enough for you to understand every font size. Another thing that it's not really a tool, but just a suggestion is that I wouldn't use two vibrant colors as foreground background. If you look at those two, you could really see how the color vibrates. So this is uh, super distracting, and at the end, mm, it's avoiding us to show our message. So very important for us is to choose the right color depending, depending on what kind of data we want to plot. There are three basic color schemes. 
One is the qualitative one for discrete or categorical data. In this case, it really doesn't matter what type of color it is. It doesn't have to be uh, perceptually arranged, like from a lighter to a darker color. They just have to be different enough. Um, we also have the sequential color scheme for quantitative data ordered from low to high, for example. And in this case, it's important that it goes uh, sequentially from a gradient uh, from a lighter color to a darker one. It could be monochromatic, but you can also use different colors as long as they're arranged from a light to a dark. We will see how easy it is to mess that up later on. <laughs> um, there's a, th a third color scheme, the diverging one, for deviations from a mean of zero. In that type of color palette, um, there are two very different colors at the extremes, and they get lighter until they meet in a common, um, more lighter color. Let's talk really briefly about typography, and then we're done. <laughs> Um, just typogra typography is very important to create visual hierarchy and it also sets the overall tone for your design. Put very simple, typography is the art of arranging typeface in different font, uh, sizes and spacings. And what is typography? Well, <laughs> typography is arrangement of different, uh, a family of different fonts, <laughs> while fonts refer to different width, weights, and styles that at the end constitutes the typeface. So let's put it a little simpler. Um, if we look at the Helvetica typeface, we see that the same um, typeface has different fonts. It comes in an ultralight, condensed, oblique, bold, heavy extended, or black extended. We can also see how by increasing size and boldness, um, it's also more impactful. Um, there are several classifications of typefaces, but let's keep it simple. Let's just talk about serif typefaces, the ones that have a decoration, a serifa, on the terminal of each letter. And um, we have sans serif, the ones that don't have that. Uh, we have script typefaces that are more calligraphy based. And we have display uh, typefaces, the ones that are more decorative, like if you uh, think about a Western, an old Western movie or something like that. Uh, the thing is that by choosing the right typeface, you can make uh, your text easy to read or like really different to read, like as we see in this example. <laughs> this is a spicy tuna roll recipe. And we see that in the Helvetica typeface, it is way easier and quicker to read as the script typeface. So choosing the right typeface really makes a difference. And another thing, again, is that um, typefaces also convey emotions, <laughs> again. So uh, changing a typeface really sets the overall tone of what you're actually saying. Let's put an example of the same phrase in different typefaces. It goes from a happy one to a better run for my life one. <laughs> so it's really important to know what you're actually doing. But I mean, at the end of the day, as scientists, we want to um, transmit the information in a way that's neutral and objective. So we should only use serif or sans serif typefaces. Um, serif typefaces like Times New Roman have been around for quite some time. They're actually, um, they come from a time where science was made by the higher class. So they're supposed to transmit uh, sophistication, elegance, but also objectivity. And um, they've been slowly but surely uh, more present, uh, the sans serif typefaces that are uh, designed to be a little bit more clearer and neutral. They don't have those decorations, so the negative space in between the letters is bigger, and therefore, in my opinion, easier to read, especially if you're doing like figures or something that could be in a, in a small size. So we talk about typeface font size. Let's see a little bit about spacing, just as a <laughs> suggestion. Just by leaving a little bit of space, it's already way easier and quicker to read. And this is, again, just because of the negative space between the lines. Let's see this example. By applying everything that we've seen about uh, composition and typeface, we already see how we can change from a messy um, design to a way easier and quicker design. And we see how here they applied different, uh, they changed the typefaces, they created a visual hierarchy, 
If you look at, those, uh, at that example, we see how our, our eye goes straight to the world's best, then sees the pineapple, and then sees the brand's name following by the next information. So they already decided in which directions uh, we want or they want their viewers to look at their information. And just by creating negative space, it makes everything way easier and quicker to understand. Well, just as a reminder, what's <laughs> important uh, when working with typography. And now let's get to the part where we actually hear how to make your data pop. We're going to see some tips and uh, tricks to what to avoid. Um, I'm going to use the same um, separation and talk about perception, composition and color. And then we're going to see one example. So first of all, I want you to understand that there is a difference between a nice figure and a useful figure. For example, this really nice figure, a Venn diagram, is completely useless if it has more than three categories. There's obviously also bad and useless figures um, that really don't get better if you look more closer to them. Um, but most of the figures we made are scientifically correct, but could just be improved visually, or at least take into consideration those rules um, that we've seen in graphic design. One of them, for example, is um, perception-related mistakes. Um, this figures, for example, 3D plots, are scientifically correct and they're pretty cool, but it's proven that our brain needs 60% more time to read a 3D plot rather than, for example, that color gradient. So at the end, if we're talking about our viewer's attention span, and it's small, <laughs> we'd rather make it quick, right? Another thing that our brain doesn't really like are, is reading proportions. So pie charts are really something that we don't like. And if we use them, it should be for portions that are bigger than a quarter, because smaller than that, our brain just needs more time than it should. Um, if we combine 3D, with pie charts, then we get to that horrible thing over there. And we see that the cyan part and the orange part look more or less the same over here. But if we change it to a 3D, uh, to a 2D, we see that they're pretty different, actually. So our brain has um, problems interpre uh, interpreting um, perspective. I would rather use bar charts that are mo more clear and quicker to understand than a pie chart, for example. Another thing that you might not like, <laughs> that our brain doesn't want, or has more trouble with, is reading vertical or um, angled text. It is proven that we need 50% more time to read this information. And again, <laughs> time is gold right now. So just by rotating, oh, sorry, just by rotating, uh, the figure, it would be already way easier to read. I know this is not very conventional, but <laughs> this would be the, the correct way to do it perception-wise. Um, let's talk a little bit about composition. Um, I, would, I wouldn't use to busy backgrounds because they affect the, that negative space that we've been talking about. Um, and they also um, make your information way more, um, well, it's way more difficult to read your information. So I also would avoid uh, patterns, for example. Um, let's look at the poster, for example. Um, this poster uh, has a lot of <laughs> wrong choices, let's say like that. <laughs> it has too much text, um, too much noise. Again, this is because there's not enough white, white space or negative space. And um, we can see how tiny the, the gutter, the space in between the columns is. Just by making it bigger, it would be way easier to define the separate sections. Um, it's also a wrong color choice because, I mean, a white background with red letters is already a little bit mm, ugly. But then again, it fights with the heather of each section visually. So there's really not a clear uh, hierarchy of information. Let's look at a good poster. <laughs> Again, this example, there's a lot of uh, uh, negative space or white space. Um, 
as always, simplicity or less is more. Um, we can reduce the text by just creating bullet points. In that way, we also increase negative space. And then what I like is that they use the repetition of style. Uh, just by using the same color palette, the same header, and uh, the same general style, it makes the design a whole. And again, not a collage of different styles put together. So we arrived at color. There are three things that I want to think about or that you should consider when working with color. And is again, to use color with intention and to be colorblind friendly, which now it's way more important and, and to use the right colors or color gradients. Let's look at that gradient over here. It's supposed to be sequential data. That means from a zero to a certain number. And in this plot, they start with an orange color, then go to a sand color, then go to a red color, then go to an orange color again. I mean, this doesn't make any sense and it doesn't do you a favor. It just makes, takes more time to understand. So choosing the right color maps brings me to this. I'm sure most of you have used this color <laughs> map at some point. Um, it's really common. It's the rainbow or jet color map. And it's totally scientifically incorrect, <laughs> especially if we're talking about sequential data. Um, this uh, super nice uh, scientist, Fabio Crameri, has been working for quite some time with uh, color maps that are colorblind friendly and has a lot of different palettes. Um, and he has um, figured out that um, there are many inconsistencies uh, in that uh, rainbow jet color map. He created a much more um, colorblind friendly and scientifically correct color gradient called Bathlo, which has um, a perfect distance between the colors compared to the jet, who has very different um, spaces between the different colors. Um, let's see it here. If we, for example, arrange the colors in the rainbow jet from color to lightness, we see that they're super different. And we also see that the incremental contrast between the changes in color is super uh, variable. But with the bath low gradient, um, we go from a light color to a dark color, and the changes are uniform. In this example over here, we see how using the right color maps can really transmit the same information as we want to, or just distort it. So imagine if you do a biodiversity color map or a rainfall, and you can use um, a, the bath low color gradient to um, convey your information and being also colorblind friendly. There are several ways of being colorblind friendly. There are already existing palettes that are already designed so that the contrast or the changes to a colorblind audience wouldn't uh, change too much. But if you want to do them for yourself, there are a few rules that you can follow. Uh, one of them is to avoid red, um, mostly and especially in combination with green. But if you do have to use it, um, you can always um, use certain tricks, like for example, if you change the red for a magenta-like color, you already see how it increases the contrast for a colorblind audience. Um, there are other combinations of colors that work very, uh, very well, like blue and red and blue and orange, but um, a little darker colors with uh, different combinations of brightness in hue. Um, for sequential colors, for example, uh, you can use the um, color gradients of the scientists that are pretty good. Um, or you can use a monochromatic color, for example, with different combinations of white or dark. In that way, it doesn't matter what color you choose because the information is in the lightness of that color. Um, for divergent colors, that information that goes from a mean or, a, or a zero, um, you can use combinations of blue or red or purple and green, for example. But there are other ways of making your information uh, be un understood by a broader aud audience. For example, for this um, paper, I helped uh, my friend um, Jose Barragan to create the small illustrations in the figure 
and they already make the figure easier and quicker to understand. Another way of uh, helping um, your information um, be understood by a broader audience is to include icons. For example, this figure, um, I helped a group of really nice researchers that work with giraffes. And um, it's supposed to represent uh, metapopulations abundance of the giraffes in relation to different scenarios, like for example, town and barriers, or with law enforcement, with predators, or with climate, like rainfall, and different combinations of them. You can see how with the use of some icons, you already make your information easier and quicker to understand. Another way <laughs> of making um, your data um, colorblind friendly is by applying those rules that we saw before. The proximity law and the similarity law. Just to refresh, the proximity law talked about elements that are close to each other, are grouped together, and the similarity one said that, that elements that have the same color are also grouped together. So if we just simply put the labels with the same color as the series to, the, to which they belong, we already um, can erase our legend and it makes our color um, um, well, <laughs> understandable for a colorblind audience too, without having to think too much about what color palette to use. If you're not sure if your color palette is colorblind friendly, you can visit this website and put your color over here, your color palette, and it will just show you how you could see it in different types of color blindness. If you don't want to use a website, you can always use the trick of converting your graph to a grayscale, and if it still <coughs> makes sense, then you're pretty good to go. All right, now we arrived at a really made up and highly exaggerated example. <laughs> I want to emphasize this because I know you do way more, uh, way more beautiful graphs than this, but I wanted to ex exaggerate it in order to be able to apply all of the rules that we have seen until, until now. So first of all, if we see at that graph, um, we have to declutter, right? Uh, we don't need frames and figures, they just take space and create clutter. Another thing that we would like to do is to think about the visual hierarchy. What's important in a graph? At the end, it's our data, right? So anything that creates a little bit of confusion or takes the importance away of a graph should go away. And even though graphic um, designers don't like grids, as scientists, I know that uh, grids um, may help you um, to understand values when they're fur further away of your graph, of your axis, sorry. Um, another thing that you, we should always do is to fix the angled text. This way it is quicker to understand, as we saw in a perception point of view. Um, another thing that I would do now would be changing the typeface, just because if it's a figure, it's going to be small, and small figures read better in sans serif uh, fonts, typefaces. Um, another thing that I would do is to apply again the proximity and the similarity law as we've seen before. Just by moving the labels next to each series, we already apply this law. And by changing the color to match the one of the series, we apply the similarity law. This already takes away the legend again. Another thing that we could do is change color. Let's pretend that for some reason <laughs> you want to stick to that palette. Just by adding some gray, you will already um, decrease a little bit that vibrant um, colors and you will make it easier to look at. But let's pretend that we want to put an intention to what we're doing here and pretend that our focal species is blah blah too. And for some reason, we want the people to know how important it is to continue working with them or for whatever reason. Uh, and the others are doing just fine. <laughs> so if we change the color to a color that really shows uh, or, or makes our focus go um, to that color and we use a grayscale for the rest of them, it really 
um, comes to the focus. So we're applying not only um, all the laws that we've seen until now, we are also applying the principle of past experience, saying, hey, pay attention to me. And we're applying the focal point uh, principle, which is focusing on what's important here, which is our blah, blah, two. So we see how with just applying some rules, just rules, we can get a cleaner image. It's obviously, um, you can make this better all the time. <laughs> you can use icons or illustrations or do uh, another um, figure sometimes, but it's just rules that I hope that can help you. So we arrived at this section. Don't worry, you, have, you don't have to, <laughs> to write down any links. I'm going to give all the links afterwards so you can just chill and enjoy. Um, I'm just going to <laughs> give you some web pages and programs that I like or that I use. Um, web page wise, I like a WIS palette, the one we've seen to check if your graph is colorblind friendly. Um, this page over here um, just extracts palettes from an image. Um, we have Fabio Cromeri's website with all different color palettes and color maps. Um, color Picker helps you to create color palettes. I really love this website over here, Material Design, because you can download free icons, uh, also free fonts. And this one over here allows you to create um, color palettes. But not only that, it will also tell you until which font size you can use one color in relationship to the background you're using. So it's pretty, pretty helpful. Um, for in case you use uh, stock photos, there are websites for free stock photos for presentations or whatever you might need. Um, there's also typography free uh, web pages like Google Fonts or Font Squirrel. And well, we've arrived at the programs. I know you're at least have, have, have heard about Adobe programs. Um, they're pretty powerful, but they're also really expensive. So I'm a super fan of this one over here called Figma. It's a freeware. It's accessible for any type of computer, Linux, Mac, or Windows. It's in the cloud. You can also access it, access it only in a browser or on your computer. Um, it stores um, and saves automatically in a cloud. So you can not only not even worry about saving your, your work, but you can also restore for versions from several months. So this is pretty useful. And what I like that is, is that uh, it has a very bright community, many tools, tutorials, and support. And just so you know, uh, Figma has two different types of files. It has Figma Jam, which, is, um, which are like whiteboards to create different um, meetings, brainstorms, diagrams, plannings, or research. And you can use text, shapes, drawings, images, and sticky notes, or other elements, to present ideas and jam together with all your collaborators at once and live. Um, there's also this other file, Figma Design, to create, share, and test designs. Um, you can create vector graphs, photography, composition, and text, which again translates into it being able to modify figures from R, which I do a lot. <laughs> um, and also design posters, papers, social media, presentations, and so on. Um, this whole presentation has been designed in Figma, obviously. <laughs> and I mean, if you're interested, I really would like you uh, to do a workshop about this tool and to try to learn a little bit about it, because it's really powerful. And again, it's free. And it combines all three elements of design, vectors, photography, and composition. Um, just so you know how it looks like, it's a little bit similar to Illustrator or Photoshop, but it combines all the powerfulness of all of three. And well, thank you so much for your attention. Um, I hope you liked it, just as a take home message. Um, I hope that with these tools, we can change um, the fact that people want or have to read a paper and change it to people wanting actually to read our papers because that actually my, um, made your audience wider and maybe include people that are not from your field or even not even related to science. So thank you very much. 
And well, those are my socials. And if you scan that QR code, you will get the links and the summary of this presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Paula. For sure, I'm gonna <laughs> rewatch uh, this YouTube video whenever I will do a poster <laughs> or anything or like a figure. Uh, yeah, scan the QR. <laughs> Any questions from the room? Thanks a lot, Paula. That was really helpful, and you can count me for your workshop uh, <laughs> when you said it. Perfect. I just wanted to confirm something. Did I understand you correctly when you said if we use um, the right color palette, we can have a figure that's both colorblind friendly and that will work nicely in grayscale too? Um, yes. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, very, very useful. So uh, can you elaborate a little, a little bit further the negative space uh, concept? So the space is gold in, in our field. And yeah, I'm not true. sure whether you are considering a, a, a given proportion of a space that should be left empty or if there's a rule or, you know, how, how you deal yeah. with the right proportion of empty space. Thank you. I mean, it also depends on the, on the message or the type of design you want to create. But um, at least you should count with um, four times the space that you inver inverted in the actual element you're comparing to. If, for example, um, the text is this big, then you should consider at least four times in each direction if you want to focus on that element only. I mean, it also depends on what you want to focus on. But, um, and there are several ways of, of using uh, negative space. So it really depends on what kind of, of, of design you're creating. I know it's not like a <laughs> really clear answer, but there are many answers to that, yeah. Hi, thank you so much for that. That was fantastic and beautiful. Um, <laughs> I want to play devil's advocate a little bit because I saw <laughs> a YouTube video I saw uh -huh, yeah. a few weeks ago. It was about, it was about like clickbait in YouTube videos hmm. and um, Basically, is there, a, is there a danger, or do you think there's any danger if, if, we, if, if people only apply like visual graphic design tools to their, to their figures so that they're really, really visually appealing, given that then you're kind of hijacking the biochemistry of someone to be like, oh, that looks like a great figure, that must be, they must know what they're talking about. Is that a means for sort of more clickbait in science where people just have a positive reaction but are actually ignoring the actual underlying data in the in the plot like i don't know if you've ever thought about if <laughs> ever thought about that but i just wondered if you yeah had any I mean, comments on that i mean at the end there is a difference between making a figure really attractive or beautiful and making it useful and in science we should always keep in mind that there has to be a balance between how impactful a figure is but also keeping it u uh, useless, <laughs> I mean useful. <laughs> Mine are useless. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if there's, for example, a lot of color and it's really don't, it's not giving information, so it's just cluttering. So then again, we could apply that rule of decluttering and making everything as simple as possible, as easy to understand, but obviously choosing color in the right form so that it can attract someone's, um, someone's view without really like, um, cluttering your actual result. So, well, I don't think um, that that would be an issue, but I mean, who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you, thank you. Yes, um, I agree with everyone else. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation. And I just, it's uh, actually more of a comment <laughs> than a question uh, because uh, I, I, have, I have worked with you and uh, mm -hmm. you. You have done magic to our figures. <laughs> uh, and I think that um, it, it's very useful that uh, you teach us. And I'm also up for the workshop, and there are certain tricks. But I think at uh, this time, at, at uh, this age, figures have become so complicated often yeah. that you just need help from a graphic designer like yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe the way is also mm, to, when we, get, uh, uh, when we ask for funding, to uh, um, appropriate some money 
for this to say, okay, we're gonna make our figures, you know, uh, this is the money for graphic design, and make this more acceptable in the, in the, in the scientific area, because I, um, uh, ultimately sometimes you just, uh, you, uh, you just cannot do what a proper graphic designer can do. So um, that, uh, that, that we must, because uh, again, what you did with our figure, there was no way <laughs> any of us would have been able to do that. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, uh, yeah, it was just fantastic. So I think uh, that's also an important thing to do, is to consider the help of professionals. Thank you, that would be awesome. <laughs> 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 okay, some, somebody wants to read them in YouTube. <laughs> I will. Uh, give me a sec. Maybe you can come closer when you when you leave. <laughs> I mean, it should look. Oh, it doesn't work. <coughs> we have a comment from Jeff uh, that he's wa watching it from Brazil. Very interesting oh. points presented. Congratulations. <laughs> so that's <laughs> for, uh, for you. And uh, a question from Julia. Uh, would you say that the presentations and posters should have sans serif or serif type fonts? I mean, I know uh, in general in science we don't really choose um, the typeface we use because they're usually like decided by rules of a journal or a scientific committee or for a congress, a conference, for example. But I mean, in my opinion, I will always use uh, sans serif typefaces because I think they're more neutral and easier to read. But again, I mean, that's that's for you to decide. Um, the only thing that I would say is that for figures or really small text, I would uh, rather prefer to use uh, sans serif typefaces. Okay. I think all there, is also the, there was another difference between that sans serif are easier to read when digital, no? Like in exactly. a screen, yeah. rather like when it's printed. And in paper, like yeah. But okay. at the end, we mostly work with screens now. I mean, we don't usually look that much at like printed um, text anymore. Mm. So I would rather stick to that if I had to choose between two. OK, so more question there. Sorry. I'm up as <laughs> well like for the workshop, <laughs> eh, by the way. Just, just on that topic a little bit, um, do you think that we need to rethink the way that papers are created visually for like an online digital uh, age like I mean <laughs> yes <laughs> I think there is really an update needed not only to display your data more um, powerfully but also I have the feeling that um, editors when working with papers um, they don't really pay the attention to what the figures are actually saying or if it needs a bigger or smaller size they're just rules and they follow those rules and that's how the paper looks at the end but there are some graphs, for example, that are suddenly way too big and could be included in a smaller format. And other graphs that would need a little bit more space in order to be uh, easier or quicker to understand, I think. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Uh, uh, sometimes I like to play with uh, icons and silhouettes mm -hmm. and um, looking for uh, icon repositories. Uh, the, the free ones, perhaps is the one that you mentioned, yeah. are in a way quite limited for the kind of things I want to do. And then I, I found other kind of repositories with thousands of uh, icons mm. and, and silhouettes, but quite expensive. Yeah. Is there any trick to create you know, some sort of uh, customized uh, I icons or silhouettes? Uh, how, how do you work with that? I mean, yeah, usually there are icons that really don't exist for what we're searching for, or at least not, as you said, for free. So I usually create them myself. Again, we can do that in the workshop <laughs> if you want. But uh, sometimes with just p uh, arranging or putting together different basic shapes, like circles and rectangles, and then just creating some, some details, you can create um, very um, easily 
uh, icons that can help you help you out or that don't don't exist. So please let's arrange a date and time <laughs> for the <laughs> Think it will be terrific. Yeah. Okay, so I guess that that's all. Thanks a lot. I think now that as researchers we have to be superman, superwoman, <laughs> uh, because we have to know about everything, also like about graphic design. Uh, I think it was very useful for us, for us all. And so let's see when is this workshop. And thanks again all for coming, and thanks Paula for this interesting. Thank you. Talk. <laughs>